Have you ever had some news <clears throat> that was just so exciting that, that you had to tell someone? I was a teenager, and I was watching the Detroit Tigers when Jason Thompson, who was their slugging first baseman at the time, hit a home run. And we're not talking about that, that barely cleared the right field fence, but it was a, a monstrous home run, home run that he hit it not only over the fence, it went over the roof and out of Tiger Stadium. And I knew that this had only been done a handful of times throughout the history of Tiger Stadium. And so I was so excited, I had to tell someone there was only one problem. My two older brothers were gone, my dad was gone, and the only one in the house was my mom. And, I, and she didn't watch the games much. And I went to the kids, I said, Mom, Mom, you should have seen it. Jason Thompson just hit a home run over the roof. That's nice. No, you don't get it. He hit the ball out of the stadium. And I don't know what she said after that, but it was obvious that she did not share my excitement. Do you find that's also true when we share our faith with Jesus, uh, about Jesus? That we have the greatest news ever, and yet outside of the church, very few people share our excitement. And I get it. They're, they're kind of leery. It reminds me of the time that Debbie and I hired a flooring guy years ago. And before leaving, he said, man, I just have to tell you about something that changed my life. And so he proceeded to share all the good things that had come out because of this thing in his life. And he even invited us to join him on the journey. I wonder what he could be talking about. Well, what was that good news that, that just had to be told that he invited us to, to join him? Amway. And I get it sounded great, and for my, a lot of people, it did change their lives, but we declined the offer. And yet, I guarantee you that he did not lack, uh, let our lack of enthusiasm keep him from telling others, and neither should we. We are in a series titled, It Had to Be Told, and there are four accounts of Jesus' life, and they are called the Gospels, which means good news. They are written by four different authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as you would expect, the accounts are not identical. In fact, out of all that Jesus said and did, there are only ten events that you will find in all four of those Gospel accounts. Not even the Christmas story is on this list. And so, through this series, we are looking at what these ten events are, and why each one was considered so important that it had to be told by each author. By the, these stories are so captivating that even John, knowing that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already written about them, he felt obligated to share them again. Last week, we looked at John the Baptist. John was the cousin of Jesus, and, and John was a pretty strange guy. In fact, I heard someone recently describe John the Baptist as... Cousin Eddie of the Trinity. <laughs> well, you think about it. John, John was kind of strange, but his story still had to be told. It had to be told because of its importance. He was proclaiming that the long-awaited Messiah had finally arrived. And not only had he arrived, the kingdom had drawn near, but the kingdom is going to draw very near. And John told us how to prepare for Jesus' arrival. He said, like a garden, we have to till our hearts. We have to clear away the debris. Anything that would keep us from, keep that news from penetrating our hearts and our lives. And here's this mic again. It's going to drive me crazy. Well, we also learned from John's example that to experience all that Jesus offers, he must become greater and greater, and we must become less and less. Because that is the key to experiencing the goodness of God. John proclaimed that we must demonstrate that we have surrendered to Jesus through, our repent, or through repentance and baptism. That once we des, uh, decide to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we turn from our former way of life and we begin living God's plan. That is called repentance. Baptism, it is an act of submission which identifies us, and the Bible says it unites us with the blood of Jesus. And so if you have never made that decision to follow Jesus, man, I would love to talk to you before you leave because it can transform your life. 
Well, that brings us to our second story. Today we are going to look at the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. So what do you think it is? I mean, is it Jesus healing someone who was par- they were paralyzed and now they can walk? Or maybe it's Jesus restoring sight to someone who's been blind? Perhaps it's Jesus raising a dead person back to life because he had done that on multiple occasions. How about him casting out demons and restoring the mind of a crazy lunatic? I mean, these are all good possibilities, yet it it is none of those. The only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels has nothing to do with physical healing. Which is interesting to me because that seems to be what drives most people to pray. And it's that physical healing or lack of that causes people to decide whether God cares or not. But this miracle has nothing to do with physical healing. The only miracle which all four Gospels write uh, write about and felt had to be told is the feeding of the 5,000. Out of all the miraculous things that Jesus did, why is this the only one that all four talked about? And it is interesting because Jesus did heal on that day, yet it's mentioned very briefly, basically one sentence. Uh, There's no details, and not every author even talked about it. Now, of course, we can only speculate what each one was thinking, but by looking at the various accounts, how they reported the event, as well as the events surrounding it, I think we can draw some pretty accurate conclusions. And the first is, this was the miracle with the most witnesses. So think about it. It says there were 5,000 men, plus women and children, which meant that for years to come, when the skeptics would say, you know what, I have heard the stories of Jesus And I don't believe it because that could never happen. You have probably 10 to 15,000 people, eyewitnesses, who could say, oh, no, it was true, or it is true. I was there, and I saw it with my own two eyes. If you want to know if a story is credible, you look for witnesses. Eyewitnesses tell you what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced. They were there. They can verify. They can testify to it. And the more eyewitnesses the more likely the story is true. 15,000 witnesses? Uh, That's pretty convincing, yet it's only icing on the cake. Did you know there was far more documentation about Jesus and his life outside the Bible than any other ancient figure, including Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar? There is historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, as well as scientific and medical evidence that his death His burial and his resurrection was no hoax. Then when you add to that the information recorded in the Bible, such as there are four different accounts of Jesus' life, and they were written when thousands of witnesses were still alive, which is not the case for Caesar or Alexander, there is overwhelming evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. When compared to any other historical or religious writings, the reliability of the Bible is very convincing. Really, there is no comparison. No other religious book in the world has the level of accuracy or provability. The Bible and the life of Jesus stands alone. So again, all four writers communicate the number of witnesses, and I think that's why they picked this one miracle. And yet from Matthew's account, we can also conclude that it had to be told because it communicates Jesus' humanness and his compassion for people. Matthew gives us the most details concerning the death of John the Baptist. Now, again, John was Jesus' cousin. Jesus would have known him since childhood. And so Matthew tells us how and why John was put to death by Herod. And you can read that on your own in Matthew 14. I'm not going to read it now, but you can read about that. But Matthew adds something that the others don't. In Matthew 14, verse 13, Matthew writes, As soon as Jesus heard the news... He left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. He left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. The news of John's death hit Jesus very hard. Probably because he knew John. And yet maybe because of the reason and the way that John died. His death was a direct result of his mission for God. His life was taken in a very 
inhumane way. He was beheaded, and then his head was presented on a platter. Contrast that, or could it be, I'm sorry, could it be that Jesus needed to get away because it reminded him of the way that he knew he was going to die. He was going to be crucified. And he knew he would be killed because of his mission from God. And he knew that it would be excruciating and a very inhumane death. If you recall, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus was in the garden pleading for his life to be spared. Father, may this cup pass from me. This is, this is not what I want to do. It, can there be some other way? Jesus was so distraught, it says he was sweating drops of blood. And medical science now realizes that that's a result of extreme stress. So is it possible that after hearing the news of John, Jesus needed to get away to pray and to refocus his mind so he would yield to the will of his father? Because just like you and I in a human body, he had free choice. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed, and they followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed them. Again, because Jesus was fully human, he was struggling himself, and yet he still had compassion for those around him. And so he was able to focus on their needs and give himself away. He was able to do what only he could do. But then after healing everyone, the disciples showed up and they said, Jesus, send, send the people away so they could eat. But instead, we see that Jesus fed them all with five loaves and two fish. But then notice what Matthew states next, verse 22. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray, and night fell while he was there alone. But did you catch it? He went up into the hills by himself to pray. So Matthew alludes to it again. Jesus was struggling, but his plans were interrupted by people in need. And so he, he forgot about himself, and he put them first. However, just because he put them first, that did not change his inner struggle. So I believe that Matthew shares this insight because it reveals Jesus' humanness as well as his compassion for people. That in the midst of his own struggles, he saw their need and he met it. And he calls you and I to do the same. Sean McMullen writes, after meeting friends one morning for breakfast, I was walking in my car, and just a few spaces from where I parked, I, I noticed this sleek new pickup with an extended cab, and it was angled across two parking spots, and my sense of fairness erupted in a string of critical thoughts. Why take two spaces? I mean, is that new truck really that special? How selfish can a person be? Anybody relate to that? Because I know it sounds a lot like me at times. He says, as I fumed silently over the senseless offense, an elderly husband and wife walked out of the restaurant behind me. The woman moved slowly and unsteadily as if she might topple over at every, any moment. The man walked behind her and he cupped underneath her elbow, leading her toward the truck. He opened the door as wide as it would go and he helped her into the seat. My critical thoughts dissipated when I realized what he had done. He took two spaces in the parking lot to make it as easy as possible for his struggling mate to get in and out of the truck. And so what I had mistaken as hubris or extreme pride and arrogance had become one of the kindest, most tender acts of love I had witnessed in a long time. I watched a couple drive away and I thought, how often have I criticized the words and the actions of other people without any knowledge of what they lived through? or what they're going through at the moment. How often do we ignore people in need because we have judged them without knowing their story? What if the bully is being bullied at home? Or the impatient driver that we'd like to make a few gestures at 
is responding to an emergency. Or the distracted and the slow, uh, slow sales clerk or wait staff person is dealing with something at home. We don't know if they have just lost a loved one, if they have been diagnosed with a serious illness, or they're just simply battling depression. All we know is they are interfering with our plans, and we don't like it. And that was not Jesus. Listen to how Isaiah described Jesus. This is in Matthew 12, 20. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. See, weak and vulnerable, they can be uh, obliterated with minimal effort. And if you think about it, people can be like that as well. Yet Jesus, rather than break those who were at the breaking part point, loved them and restored them and gave them hope. And he calls us to do the same. I'm going to switch mics. And so we have the witnesses to the miracle, and a great number of witnesses. We have the humanness and the compassion of Jesus to those in need. And yet this miracle also demonstrates that though our power is limited, his is not. Prior to this, Jesus had sent out the 12 disciples, and he said, I want you to go preach. I want you to heal the sick. And in, in certain uh, gospel accounts, we find they had just returned, and they were talking about all the amazing things that God had done through them. We also know that this group of 12 disciples had a tendency to think too highly of themselves. So let's pick up the story from John's perspective in John 6.1. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went, because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. That's why there's so many people. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. I love that verse. He already knew what he was going to do. He was testing Philip. And so he really wasn't asking for Philip's advice. He's pointing out Philip's lack of power and Philip's lack of faith. Because I'm guessing that Philip was one of those who was doing a lot of bragging about how awesome he was on that recent mission trip. Now, John, the disciple, not John the Baptist, was, was the one writing this gospel. And he was also probably Jesus' best friend on earth. And so... As he writes, he already knew what he was going to do. I, I picture Jesus giving John a wink. It's like they're, they're there, and, and they both see Philip kind of strutting around, and, and Jesus and John make eye contact. And I, I just picture Jesus giving a wink, and he says, Hey, Philip, where are we going to get food to feed all these people? And Philip says, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Jesus is just giving the week, okay, John, watch what's going to happen here. He's making point. You've just talked about all the amazing things that you did, Philip. Take care of this one, too, knowing that Philip could not even handle the situation. There's no way he could handle the situation. And so this miracle demonstrates Jesus' power is far greater than ours. Well, Andrew was there, and Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, we have a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? And Jesus very calmly says, hey, tell everyone to sit down. And so they all sat down on the grassy slopes, and the men alone numbered about 5,000. So again, you add in the women and children, probably ten to 15,000 people. And then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. And after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. And so they picked up the pieces and they filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Isn't that amazing? Jesus not only fed upwards of 15,000 people with five loaves and two fish, but after they all finished eating as much as they wanted, there was a buffet there. They had far more than what they started with. And it reminded me of what Sue shared 
during communion last week, I think it was, when she said she had learned through personal experience that God is faithful and God is her provider, that we can trust him because his power is far greater than ours. So let me ask you a question. Have you learned that lesson yet? Do you realize that God can handle far more than you can? I mean, he already knows what he plans to do in your life, and he will provide everything that you need to make that happen. And so he's just waiting for us to come to that realization to surrender and to trust him. And as we do, this is amazing, as we do, we discover that his goodness and his power is far greater than we ever imagined just as Katie talked about. See, this miracle, is a, it's an example of how our not enough becomes more than enough when we place it in Jesus' hands. I want us to stop for a minute and think, what could God do through your life, through my life, if we totally surrendered everything to him? We have no idea what he could do. Angus McGillivray was a Scottish prisoner of war in a Japanese prison camp during World War II. Now, there were other prisoners, Americans, Australians, Brits. They were from the Allied forces as well. And the camp had become a very dark place. This is the same group that built the bridge over the River Kwai, which they made a movie about. But it had become a very dark place. The prisoners had no regard for their fellow allies. They cheated from one another. They stole from one another while they slept. And so the law of the jungle prevailed. It was survival. Survival is everything. And yet despite all of this, Scottish prisoners took their buddy system very seriously. Their buddy was called their mucker. And they believed it was up to them to make sure that their mucker survived. Well, Angus's mucker was dying. In fact, everyone but Angus had given up on him. But he was determined that his friend was going to pull through. So when someone stole his mucker's blanket, who would steal from a dying man? They did. When someone stole his mucker's blanket, Angus gave him his own. Every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and he would feed his mucker. Angus was willing to do anything and everything to see that his mucker would recover. But one day, the unthinkable happened. Angus collapsed and slumped over and died. The, dis the doctors discovered that he had died of starvation, complicated by exhaustion, that he had been given his own food and his own shelter away. He gave away everything he had, including his life. And so I say it was unthinkable because the news of Angus' death spread throughout the camp. No one could believe that big Angus had succumbed. He was strong. He's the one that they assumed would be one of the last to die. And yet when he heard the reason that he died, because of his love and his unselfishness, it had to start an impact on the camp. The men began to focus on their fellow prison mates and their friends and their fellow humanity. They focused on living beyond survival, and they started giving themselves away. They began to pool their talents. Within the group, there was a violin maker, an orchestra leader, a cabinet maker, and a professor. So soon the camp had an orchestra made of homemade instruments and a church called the Church Without Walls that was so powerful, so compelling, that even the Japanese guards attended. They started a university and a hospital and a library system in this prison camp. I mean, the entire place was transformed all because one man named Angus gave away all that he had for his friend. Angus's story is like this little boy's, and it demonstrates the potential unleashed when one person actually lives beyond themselves. Like this little boy, our not much becomes plenty for everyone when we place it in the hands of Jesus. So let me ask you, what's in your hand that God is waiting to use for his glory? I mean, and we think, well, it's only five loaves and two fish. I mean, what can God do with us? It's not much. We never know. What are you holding back because you doubt God's goodness or God's ability to provide? 
what do you have in your hand or maybe in your life that you know it has a strong grip on you and yet you know you need to release it, but you're not, and you have a long list of reasons why you can't or why you shouldn't. Whatever it is, if you do let go and you do give it to Jesus, I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. The problem is I think many times we're like Philip. We focus on what we can't do, what we cannot do, rather than what Jesus can do through us. So what about you? Are you ready to surrender? Out of all the miracles, this story had to be told because of the number of people who witnessed it. And it had to be told because it reveals not only Jesus' humanness, but his compassion for people. And it demonstrates his strength is far greater than our weakness. Do you remember the Ray Bull song from years ago? Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. You know, we never know how our decision to surrender, whether in big things or small things, we never know how it's going to be used by God to change our lives as well as the lives of those around us. And we sang, nothing is better than you. And, and Katie shared how this reality, how, this, how she discovered that reality through a very difficult situation. Are you ready to experience his goodness that nothing is better than him this morning? Then make this next song your prayer and surrender to him. In fact, if you would like us to pray or if you would like to make a decision of any kind, man, please see me or during the song, make your way to the cross over here and we will find you and we will meet you there and we will pray with you and talk with you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. And, Lord, again, that truth, nothing is better than you. It is true, but we sometimes doubt that. It is true, but we don't always experience that. It is true, but we don't always take action. God, I pray during this next song that your spirit would just continue to move as you draw us close to your Holy Spirit and you speak deep into our hearts of your goodness and your love and your faithfulness and everything that you have available to us. May we surrender and may we submit so that we can experience more than we could ever ask or imagine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.